The real bright one is being, it's the planet Venus. Oh, I know what it is. Positively. The real bright one you'll see to the right of the moon. It's clear by now that UFOs are seen pretty much everywhere at least in every place that has the required formula for a sighting, which really just boils down to one, a strange object in the sky, and two, well, a person, obviously. But there are locations around the world that seem to attract the weirdness, places where reports come with greater frequency than others. Often, the number of reports isn't the only thing that sets these areas apart, but the strangeness of them as well. The Chestnut Ridge has been a haven for the unusual for centuries now. In the 1800s, farmers recounted sightings of ghostly apparitions, hairy creatures, and airborne fireballs, with the same frequency that locals in other parts of the country might recount running into bear, deer, or elk. That's what brings me to the ridge today. In the last couple of months, Stan Gordon has taken a higher number of UFO reports than usual, and he's invited us along on one of his investigations. Tonight, we're on the property of a local woman who lives outside of Kecksburg, who has reported multiple unusual objects in the past month. Well, Shannon, over the last several weeks, uh, people in this area and other areas miles away have been reporting at night seeing high altitude objects in the sky they're not familiar with. And they've, a lot of these people have been out for years looking at the sky at night when it's beautiful, but this is different. Some are reporting bright, luminous objects that sometimes are zigzagging, Sometimes objects appear to come together in the sky and join, then some hover, and then some take off at a high rate of speed. So once again, if you're only getting one report, but when you're getting different reports of different people miles around, it's something of interest to look into. Yeah. There's a, there's a nice aircraft. You see how it's attached to the star right there? But also, over the hill, not far away, several miles away, is, you can see the Chestnut Ridge. And of course, you know, this whole area has had a history of sightings for years and years. And people are continuing to report seeing it. In the UFO vocabulary, the phrase hotspot comes up constantly. Defining what it is exactly that separates a hotspot from any other location where people occasionally witness the paranormal is difficult. But to follow the line of thinking put forth by many modern day ufologists and researchers, a hotspot is anywhere that multiple reports exist over an extended period of time, involving a larger than usual number of phenomena. If that's the case, how many of these areas are there, and what can possibly account for the fact that they exist in the first place? Places like the Nevada desert and the upper reaches of the East Coast are often linked with the UFO subject. But while there are an unusually high number of reports in those regions, a lot of their reputation is owed to pop culture and the media. How much of the idea of a hotspot is due simply to an eagerness by location news outlets to reporting on aerial phenomena? 
Hotspots often become a sort of mecca for ufologists, who will make pilgrimages to the area in hopes of witnessing something for themselves. The Chestnut Ridge hasn't yet reached this level of popularity, but others like the Hudson Valley or Gulf Breeze in Florida are considered a prime travel destination for those seeking to see something strange. If there's anyone who can help expand on where exactly UFOs are seen, and whether or not they are actually UFO hotspots, it's probably Eleanor Haskin. Ellie is a good friend who also happens to have a PhD in folklore and a background in the UFO world as someone who once investigated sighting reports. So once someone begins to investigate UFOs or to take a critical look at UFOs or even really delve into the phenomena at all, you'll find that there are areas, particularly in the United States and around the world, that seemingly have a high concentration of sightings. And this is really odd, right? Because you wouldn't really think that certain areas are drawing in more UFOs. So some of these areas that have these multitude of sightings include places like Point Pleasant, West Virginia, West Texas, Chestnut Ridge, Sedona. Mark Matsky is part of the Small Town Monsters crew and podcast host. He's also written articles on Fortean subjects and is extremely well read on the subject of UFOs. And his day job as a Lutheran minister gives him a perspective on the subject that many in the field might shy away from. He's also spent hours taking part in witness interviews and putting boots on the ground in areas that have gained a reputation as a hotspot. There used to be a time when you thought of UFO hotspots as being largely a rural phenomena. And the reasons for that are fairly easy to understand. On one hand, you have a darker sky than you would have in an urban setting. There was much more observational potential out on farmland, for example. The Hudson Valley is a place that crosses the suburban with the rural. Located within eyesight of the Big Apple, the valley is cut in half by the waters of the Hudson River and is a strange mixture of large towns, tiny villages, and isolated pockets of people living amongst the breathtaking views afforded by the nearby mountains and forests. This is where New England really begins. And during my time in the valley, I was never unaware of the beauty and mystery that have been pulled together in this place. While the region holds some of the earliest settled areas on the East Coast, the Hudson Valley's history isn't just rooted in the founding of our country. Sightings of strange lights in the sky go back to the great airship waves of the 1900s and still further back to the 1600s giving it the reputation in ufological circles of being one of the East Coast's most well-regarded hotspots. I may be biased, but the Hudson Valley is a beautiful area uh, stretching along the Hudson River from New York City north to Albany, approximately 200 miles. So we're talking about a fairly large geographical area. Once you get out of New York City, suburbs, dairy farms, lots of woods and mountains, an enormous amount of lakes, reservoirs, and bodies of water. Can you talk about the Hudson Valley stuff? Yeah, I mean, so back in the, I'd say early mid 80s, um, even stretching into the, the early 90s, the Hudson Valley in New York, uh, thousands of boomerang shaped craft were being reported. I would say 1980, late 1982 to 89, was what I believe is the biggest wave anywhere in the country, anywhere in the world ever, when tens of thousands of people on any given night would see these massive triangles. This was, this was an equal opportunity wave of UFO sightings. Many police officers, emergency room physician, Air Force personnel, teachers, just regular everyday old people going back and forth to work. It was everybody. While the Hudson Valley began to erupt with unusual activity, locals across the region began to report their own bizarre sightings to anyone who would listen. While in the town of Goshen, New York, we had the opportunity to meet and speak with a witness named Gary Tribert, who had a bizarre string of events unfold in his life beginning in the 1960s. Among the series of fascinating stories he would tell us 
was one involving what he believes was one of the infamous Hudson Valley Black Triangles. Just one night, my, my wife went to bed kind of early, and I was sitting up watching TV, and my dog was going crazy outside. And finally, I went out because he wouldn't stop barking, and I saw this object, and it was like, I describe it as a ball of Christmas lights, and, but it was huge because there was a house next to me, and it was, you could see it over top of this house. And I walked down, I, was, I had lived back on a private road, I walked down my driveway and out to the main road, and I watched this thing. And when it got close to town, it shot up in the sky, you know, like a, a bullet, and, and it was just a little dot, and it shot back towards the east. I ran home, woke my wife up, of course, and I said, you, you wouldn't believe what I just saw. And anyway, I coaxed her out of bed. She came down, and as we're standing there talking on the front steps of my house, I see the point, this point coming over my roof. And it ended up being like this gigantic triangle that engulfed the sky. And I took a step off steps and waiting for this thing to move, to catch up to me, it was moving so slow. And we watched it leave. You know, I was just mesmerized watching this thing move away. And then it just kind of headed north and away. And my wife stayed and watched that, but she won't talk about it now. She kind of denies it. And these were being reported by law enforcement, first and foremost, which is like a dream come true for a UFO investigator. Anyone in authority, whether it's military, law enforcement, when they're the ones having these experiences, that's a big risk for them to come forward and say that. I can't tell you how many dozens, if not hundreds, of police officers had these sightings many accounts of they hear in one jurisdiction that this vehicle is passing overhead. They would jump in their cars and chase it, and you would have several precincts in one night trying to follow this object. So the Hudson Valley UFO wave started with the police, and it kind of ended with the police. They actually investigated all these cases, not just some UFO cranks or enthusiasts. Were, were most of the sightings taking place in rural areas or suburban areas, or, or what were the locations like? The, the sightings took place from anywhere from midtown Manhattan, uh, people's you know apartment balconies or driving down the street, to extremely rural locations. Uh, the bulk of the activity, I'd say, we can just lump into suburbia. You know, small central towns, sometimes smaller cities. So geographically, I think at this point, it's safe to say that in the United States, for example, there's nowhere that UFOs haven't been seen to where some of the most well-known modern cases have taken place in largely urbanized settings with multiple witnesses. That waned, as I said, the end of the 1980s. There was a mini wave in the Pine Bush, New York area uh, into the mid-1990s. And as for this area, I can't really say there have been any other waves, per se. Certainly short bursts of activity, but nothing to compare to the 80s or 1909. My time in the Hudson Valley was eye-opening, not simply because of the unusual melding of unpopulated and heavily populated areas, but also because it's so clearly a place where unusual things still happen. Amongst the tiny towns and villages, there is such an acceptance of the UFO subject by locals that many of the people we spoke with spoke about it as if it was any other mundane topic. If places like the Chestnut Ridge are an example of anything, it's just how unusual some geographical locations can be. What it is that witnesses are encountering in areas like this truly defy rational explanations and simply seem to create an endless litany of questions. While the sheer volume of reports in places like the Hudson Valley and the Ridge share commonalities, the unending parade of weird that marches across the skies, and occasionally the Earth, in Pennsylvania, sets up another type of hotspot entirely. One of my associate researchers, Jim Brown up in Fayette County in September, had an incident where in the afternoon, there had been a storm, it was over, it was a beautiful clear sky, 
there was one cloud in the sky. He sees first this big black sphere. He said, it looks like the size of a full moon when you see it up in the sky. It comes out of the one direction and moves directly into this cloud, but it never comes out. A short time later, two more of these big black spherical objects from different directions come across the sky, one behind another. They both enter the cloud, they never come out. His wife runs in the house to get a camera in case another one shows up. While she's in there, the fourth one appears, but this one has spikes out of several parts of the, of the diameter of this thing. It's kind of moving around and rotating. It goes into the cloud, never comes out. And then that cloud begins to change to a yellowish color. It begins to fade out and disappear. So there are these hot spots. And some scientists believe that these hot spots could be places where, you know, perhaps there are portals or there are multi ways that, that, to access other dimensions. The concept of a window area is related to that of a flap, except the window element of that attempts to get at an explanation. The idea of the window presupposes the existence of a realm beyond what we can normally see or sense. Tribal traditions all over the world have this concept of these portal areas, window zones, sacred lands, sometimes it's a taboo. Their view is that these pieces of land are areas of connection to other worlds. There was a, some aspect of this area that you could kind of access either multiple dimensions or something like that, where there are kind of portals or gateways that things were coming in and out of. That could be a reason uh, that there are these hot spots around the world for paranormal activity. But a window would then be a time and a location where whatever is in that realm that we typically can't experience, something comes through the window into ours. So that for a time, we see the light in the sky or we see the strange physical craft that seems to leave some markings in the earth behind. You know, these areas are geographically spaces of high weirdness. And what I have found through investigating these areas over the years is that, uh, again, the native traditions talk about these areas and they say, no, nope, that's the place of the spirits, that's the place where things happen. You take a chance if you go out there. There's a type of explanatory power that's meant by the window. It opens for a period, whatever is back there or behind it comes through, interacts with us for a while, and then goes back through and is gone. While the Chestnut Ridge seems to be a popular destination for unknown aerial phenomena, the entire state of Pennsylvania has a history of sightings that date back to the 1700s. Sean Forker is based in the state of Pennsylvania, where he's been evaluating the UFO topic since he was a kid. While Sean doesn't consider himself a UFO investigator, He's more familiar with the subject than most and has been involved in a number of investigations, including one that has ties to another one of my interview subjects, Alexander Petikoff. Like Forker, Petikoff is something of a newcomer to the UFO subject. He's a filmmaker and adventurer from New Hampshire who documents strange subject matter when he isn't hiking large swaths of the US. Both Forker and Petikoff investigated a series of unusual events that occurred at a small farm less than two hours from the Chestnut Ridge and ended up with more than they bargained for. We call it Area 516 uh, up in Clearfield County. They have all kinds of strange phenomena going on, strange lights, uh, orbs of lights appearing in these fields around their home. Uh, and I interviewed this family claiming there were black helicopters and and orbs and all sorts of other things, and especially UFOs. So the first year, you know, we had a little town hall meeting. We talked to lots of locals, and there were tons of stories of people seeing strange lights in the sky. My flags start going up when I start hearing all these things. Great, it's just another one of these cases where you've got one mystery compounded by another mystery. You're never gonna sort it out. You're just wasting your time. This is a, a plot of land where a family has a home on one, one area of the land. A uh, family owns a house up on the hill. They're all, you know, it's family land, they're all relative. And they all have different experiences and different things going on, but some of it's so similar. Either the, they see or hear an upright figure walking around their property, or they see strange lights, or they see strange lights in the sky. And we get up there, spend time with these folks, and I'm down in this little campground they have set up. And I'm left there with a couple of the younger kids, 
and this flash of light happens. And I can't explain it, no light, nothing. I can't explain this flash of light. So they see the flash of light. One of the kids go, did you see that thing standing in the woods over there? And I'm like, no, but we're getting out. And uh, I took them back home and people had told me that they had experienced the same thing. As they're going through, they see this flash of light and entities standing off in the distance. So once we returned in May of 2019, one of the, I think it was the second night we were there, we were all kind of dispersed in different areas doing sort of night ops. I was, of course, posted down in the woods near this property, and there was just absolutely beautiful stars. So we decided to reconvene up at the, the property that we were staying at and just kind of hang around the fire pit. We didn't have the fire on, but we were just going to do some star watching. And right after midnight, we saw what appeared to be, actually, when I, when I first looked in the corner of my eye, I just saw this kind of object in the sky. And I immediately thought it was either a star or the moon that was behind a cloud. And we all noticed it, and as we started watching it, uh, it basically just started moving through the sky in a motion, almost like a, a leaf in slow motion, just kind of bobbing up and down. We quickly realized that this was not the moon. I mean, there were no clouds in the sky at all. It completely cleared up, so this was the only thing in the sky. And we sort of just started watching this thing, and at one point, about two minutes in, a smaller object flew off of it and flew back into it, like a bright little light. Now, this object was was not really defined. It was like a, I described it as like a haze. And then this smaller object was a lot more defined, just like a bright little light, just the secondary object is parallel to the undefined object the entire time in the video. And towards the end, they kind of just become one. Uh, basically, we watched this thing until it went over the horizon and it went over the horizon. We were all still staying there for a couple minutes and then uh, a bright object went from right to left, just lightning speed just through the sky and that was it. While the Chestnut Ridge is certainly a region that remains active with reports, it's never a guarantee what you'll find when you go. In my short time there, the only thing we saw in the night sky were planes, satellites, the moon, and the planet Venus, leaving me to wonder if maybe the window closes when those on the other side know they're being sought after. Oh, that'd be creepy at night. The concept of a window area or hotspot isn't particularly new, and they certainly aren't relegated to Pennsylvania or New York. Seeking to find some sort of through line between these locations becomes very murky, however. While some researchers have tried to connect areas more active than others by ley lines, fault lines, and other less scientific patterns, the fact is these places exist around the world with no definitive characteristic that runs between all of them. There are a lot of hot spots. A lot of them are around Air Force bases, which says a lot, whether it's, again, alien technology or man-made secret experiments, test aircraft, then uh, I can't say. Also, bodies of water. I mean, my own UFO sighting took place over a body of water, and I cannot tell you how many people have come to me and said, I saw something over this lake, or I was at the beach and I saw this. What does that mean? I couldn't tell you, but a lot of people do theorize that whatever intelligence lay behind some of these UFOs, that water could be some sort of resource for them. New England is no stranger to these sort of triangle areas. Uh, most famously, we have the Bridgewater Triangle uh, just south of Boston, where there's a whole host of strange things reported, especially UFOs. Lots of spook lights seen in the swamps there, uh, in the Bridgewater Triangle. And then you have in Vermont, southern Vermont, the Bennington Triangle. And then in New Hampshire, you have what's called the Ossipee Triangle, which is this basically this perfectly circular mountain range just south of the White Mountains. I think it just goes to show that people do kind of like that idea that there are confined areas where these sorts of things happen, maybe more often than others. New York Times broke this story in December 2017 that the Pentagon was investigating UFOs. What people don't realize is that at the beginning, this uh, project was more than just UFOs. This was inspired by this place called Skinwalker Ranch. There were people claiming to see Bigfoot. There were portals that people said they saw. A lot of where cattle mutilations and UFOs, all this stuff was going on in this ranch, this area of Utah, but especially at this ranch. Uh, the Senator of Nevada was Harry Reid. He was friends with Robert Bigelow, who had actually hired a group of scientists to investigate this ranch in Utah. Harry Reid got $22 million to start this program that was actually called OSAP, but it was to investigate all of the paranormal things happening there. 
And they said that there were these hot spots around the world for paranormal activity. They were investigating. And uh, interestingly enough, this group of scientists and others seem open to that idea. Window areas are pretty interesting. I mean, we look at areas like Sedona where you see UFOs coming in and out in mass or by themselves and just disappearing out of sight. Sedona's tricky to investigate, and I'll tell you why. That Sedona in the late 80s, early 90s, became a major new age mecca. You had people moving there and coming there from all over the country who were interested in a wide range of different alternative modalities, everything from crystal healing to channeling and all these other aspects. So in the midst of that, you get the native traditions from the area that talk about the, the power centers and that, yeah, it's a, a place of what people now call vortexes. It's, it's a place of very special pieces of land. It, it's, a, it's a tricky area. It's a fascinating place and it's really beautiful. And hey, you know, if aliens want to come down and visit a cool place, Sedona's definitely one of them. Debates still rage within UFO circles as to whether or not there even is such a thing as a hotspot or a window area. In the last year, it has been posited that a window area, as put forth by John Keel, really only exists in a place where an undiscerning investigator resides. The idea being that someone like Stan Gordon or John Keel create the window area simply by failing to debunk any of the reports they take in. This would ignore the decades and occasionally even centuries worth of history relating to unusual phenomena in these locations. The Chestnut Ridge and Sedona were weird long before local researchers began taking reports of strange lights in the sky. So, do hotspots even exist at all? There is data that seems to support that they do, but why and how will remain a question I continue to ask for the foreseeable future. I'm a little bit skeptical of that because I think a lot of the sightings, if you look at some of the, the data, just have happened in terms of UFOs all over the place. Uh, just a lot of sightings over the years. Um, and I think when there's something like a Bridgewater Triangle or a Bennington Triangle, they kind of take on a spirit of their own. So people will go down there with the intent of probably having an experience. So are these things hopping in and out of some sort of wormhole or dimension? I couldn't tell you, that's a stretch for me personally. Um, I, I don't necessarily believe that there are, are specific areas that these UAP are flying in and out of, but anything's possible. There is something to the idea of a hot spot or a flap area where various phenomena can be reported for a time and it reaches almost a fever pitch and then it stops. So oftentimes people use explanation of mass hysteria in order to qualify what's happening in these places. And what that means is they'll say, oh, this one person saw something unknown. They couldn't really figure it out. It was swamp gas, it was plane, it was a jet, it was military. And that story begins to spread around a community. And then the community latches onto that and more people start imagining things happening. And it really picks up like a snowball rolling down a hill. It just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And people will qualify that as mass hysteria and say that's what's happening in these communities. Where in actuality, when you really begin to investigate, and what I mean there is talk to people, you find out that oftentimes what they're reporting is not necessarily an awareness of someone else's story, but instead, unbeknownst to them, these other sightings have been occurring, and they too are seeing something completely unexplainable or outside their understanding of the way the universe works, and they don't really know how to classify that and ultimately the stories begin to look similar as a result. If the point of this journey I'm on is to seek answers, then it seems to follow logic I'd find my way to Sedona. Sedona in the 60s and 70s was a contactee paradise, a place where those claiming to be in touch with extraterrestrial beings would come to call down the UFOs. Today, it's far more populated than it once was, and though the UFO subculture still exists here, it's more hidden away than it once was. Still, activity continues to be recounted by locals and out-of-towners alike, with places like the Stardust Ranch taking on a mythical position as the place to go to see a UFO. Multiple energy vortexes are said to exist in Sedona, places where the veil is particularly thin. It's in these locations spread about the region that UFOs are seen on a nightly basis. 
we've been told the best place to encounter a UFO is on the airport Mesa Trail, which leads right to one of these supposed vortexes. So tonight, that's where we're going. If the window is still open, I'm all for getting a look at what's on the other side. Fast. I got it. Everyone film. What's up, Shannon? Do you see it? Yeah. Oh damn, this looks crazy, dude. It does. Get on there. Yeah. No, no. Not yet. When did I turn into you? And just like that, whatever it was we saw was gone. Presumably back through the window it came in, and all I could do was stand and watch, and maybe in some sick, twisted way, wish I could follow it. Coming up on the next episode of On the Trail of UFOs. When he approached the car and asked what was going on, they reported that they were chased for about 12 miles by a large red UFO. I don't even think we'd lit cigarettes. My friend says, what the F is that? And we looked and sure enough, there's this formation of lights. These creatures, whoever's on the inside the TV looking at them, going, what's going on here? Because they didn't expect it either. So then the TV goes out, they run outside, and there's a big UFO right over their house. That's like when they got here and they're like, they're out in the field and they're like, no, I was here and this is where it was. And then, yeah, the craft out. emerged from out, when they all got back so here, from out back there behind the tree line. <laughs> okay, wow. <laughs> Immediately emerged. So they just saw like this red light coming from behind the trees. At, at first, the, at and then, yeah. yeah. At the closest, they were about 100 feet from it. It was about 100 feet off the ground. The landscape does actually drop down back there. So, you know, in theory, if there was a big craft, it could hide there. The big event was called the Incident at Exeter. And the Incident at Exeter really became known to people far and wide after John Fuller's book came out. And it brought into fame and, and under the spotlight uh, several figures. One was Norman Muscarello who was, as a kid, going into the Navy uh, at 18 years old back in the fall of uh, 1965. And he was down visiting his, his uh, girlfriends. Norman Muscarello was hitchhiking home from his girl's friend's house in Amesbury. And as he got to this farm, this large red object kind of swooped at him out of the sky. He was terrified and dove behind a stone wall because it came out of a red glow with the alternately blinking, blinking lights back and forth. And it, it literally terrified him. I mean, he was not somebody who got scared that easy. Well, he was laying in this ditch behind the stone wall. The object made a few more passes over him. Then when he thought it was safe to get up, he ran to the neighboring farmhouse and pounded on the door. This is like at 1 in the morning. They're like, we don't care what's going on. We're not opening the door for this. And uh, began walking towards Exeter and, and hitchhiking. The car came by that did eventually pick him up. He got to the police station. And he was uh, shaking a nervous wreck and how he light, light his cigarette up. And Sir Reginald Tolan was on duty at the desk. And he knew Norman from around town. He knew he was a good kid. 
You could tell he was visibly shaken. He knew he, something had happened, but it couldn't be what he was describing. I mean, that just didn't make any sense to him. It was about this time that Officer Bertram walked into the station and heard the story. And he was really intrigued by it because he had just, about an hour earlier, on Route 101, found a stopped car with two women in it who were frantic. When he approached the car and asked what was going on, they reported that they were chased for about 12 miles by a large red UFO. So when the Muscarello report came in, it kind of resonated with him. Officer Bertram thought, you know, I think I'll pick up Muscarello and we'll go back out to the site. So he picked up uh, the shaking white petrified young muscarel. They went out there. They get out of the car, they get into the field, they're not seeing anything. It was really nothing to be seen. And then all of a sudden, from behind the tree line, the manifestation of, a, of an object that was glowing red rose up out of, of behind the pine trees, and it moved forward and started to come over uh, the policeman and muscarello. So Muscarello froze in panic. Bertram dragged Muscarello back to the cruiser, and they called for uh, backup. Officer Hunt was already on his way. Hunt could see the object as he was pulling up to the scene. David Hunt arrived as it just was starting a bit to start to head off towards Hampton Beach, where you guys are staying over in that area. And the light was a blood red. It just was on both houses, farmhouses on either side like that. They all noted that the lights on it all blinked in the same pattern, like one, two, three, four. Four, three, two, one. They said at the closest, it was probably about 100 feet from them, 100 feet off the ground, and about the size of a house. The Exeter incident is, on the surface, just another UFO sighting. The most intriguing aspect of the event seems to be the number of witnesses involved, as well as the amount of the time the object stayed on the scene. Like Dan Weiss's sighting, the fact that these craft seem to hover in the air with lights flashing flies in the face of what we would expect from visitors from another galaxy attempting to simply observe humanity. UFOs have supposedly been visiting us for centuries now, but we still have no idea what their origins are. But that hasn't stopped researchers, investigators, and television theorists from staking their claim to a multitude of ideas as to where the UAPs are coming from, and yet, it all really boils down to just a small handful of core ideas. Martin Hawata, or Malava, is a tribal elder who lives near Rimrock, Arizona, who can help set the stage for the centuries of beliefs relating to the possible root of the UAP mystery. During our discussion, we were instructed to leave the name of Malava's tribe out of the interview, and also to refer to him as a Native American. It's important to remember that simply boiling down a belief system like that of Malava's people into one core principle is impossible. His people have distilled centuries of stories regarding the past and future of mankind into a series of sacred objects that no one outside of Malava's people and a few trusted friends have ever even seen before. The objects help to tell the tale of the star people, who, according to his ancestors, have been visiting Earth since the beginning of time in an effort to save us from ourselves. I have to put it in a way that uh, I have to protect my people, okay? So I'll tell you some of these things, and I'll show you some of the things. 
I really only showed a few people. This is the star people. They're not, they're not of this, they're not from here, they're from a different place. So what they would do is they would look for these X's on different planets and different worlds and different places on our earth. That's why if you look really close to this, he's sitting on some type of a, it looks like a triangle, a black triangle down here. This over here in the corner means infinity, like uh, outer space where it doesn't ever end. And then behind him is a giant star where his, he comes from. And over here is the moon. And this is Earth, what he, this is like his spaceship. But you know, it doesn't look like this. This is what they made to tell you this, this story. So all of these stories are part of all this and there's a lot more that goes to, the, to this. This is, this is the bottom where he takes off. This is clouds. This doll is not Mayan, but the headdress is Mayan because they're a descendant of who we are. These star beings here, this is their porthole that they can go from one to another. While Malava's beliefs relating to UFOs cross the spiritual with the otherworldly, in UFO circles, the extraterrestrial hypothesis is the most commonly accepted idea as to who is piloting those unknown objects seen around the world. Because the UFO phenomenon is so widespread and hits a diversity of people, and because we don't really know what is responsible for the sightings, there's a whole breadth of possibilities and theories for what is actually a UFO or what's behind the UFO or what's piloting a UFO. I think for the most part, most people probably fall into the nuts and bolts or kind of classic ET theory where it's you know, the little green men sort of thing. Extraterrestrials, which are beings from another planet, uh, another solar system, another galaxy that are coming into ours, and they have a variety of different agenda along with that. And that's speaking broadly for the general population as well. I think people are more susceptible to kind of look at that part of the, the UFO world, and that's where most people probably start out and then either move into other areas or really entrench themselves or I'll become skeptics. The theories range from everything from simply earth lights, unexplained, naturally occurring phenomena, all the way to the point of them being identified as craft or spaceships from other worlds being piloted by extraterrestrial entities. Some people like to sort of isolate that and say, oh, these are, are physical craft that have come here from another planet. The more conservative kind of feel like maybe they're probes that are unmanned that are coming here to check us out. Others feel like, you know, maybe they are manned probes that are doing the same thing, which is probably what we would do if we found a planet that was inhabited. We'd want to try to you know, discreetly observe what they were up to. One of my favorite cases actually happened in New Jersey here on the East Coast, and it was a witness by the name of George Obarski. This is back in 1975. He was coming home, it was like three in the morning. He just closed up the shop. He was going down the New Jersey Turnpike, and he saw what he described as a puffed up pancake in the air, metallic and illuminated and it was just hovering over this park. He pulled over and he gets out and he's looking at this floating metallic pancake and he sees two small beams beneath the craft and they're kind of hunched over and he doesn't know what they're doing so he gets closer. And he said that these beings had what he described as snowsuits on. If they were aliens, they definitely were prepared. They were digging into the ground and putting dirt into these like little beakers and canisters and he gets closer and closer and he thinks that they heard him and these little snow-suited beings, they scamper back into this craft and it just disappeared out of sight. So he gets in his car, he drives home. Did they leave something behind that were, they were coming back to get or do they just wanna know what this stuff is below their feet? Why is the initial sh assumption that these are alien craft? It's something that, okay, well, the military doesn't have an explanation. 
there's a, a whole bunch of these things, you know, where did they come from? And I, I think that sadly people often default to the negative. So when something like that happens, there are a lot of times there's an assumption, oh, this has got to be something really bad. It's got to be something really sinister. What could be worse than aliens dropping in? So it melded into the culture and we get this whole trend towards uh, outer space beings. Now I should say that there are problems with that. Obviously there are problems in fact with all of these theories and uh, that's part of the mystery that we're trying to solve. Sam Sheeran is a celebrated artist and an old friend. Like Ryan Sprague, Sam and I go back to the earliest days of my show, Into the Fray, when he used to co-host. One of the events that furthered his interest in unusual subjects was an encounter he had with a UFO in the skies above Los Angeles, an incident that helped cement his own personal opinion on where UAPs might be originating. So it was Halloween season 2012 in Los Angeles, Hollywood specifically, and I was staying with a friend at his apartment. We decided to step outside and have a cigarette off the balcony. We're quite familiar with LA. You, you see helicopters, you see airplanes coming from LAX and Burbank Airport, so you're really familiar, or we were, of what flies around LA. It's not unusual to see helicopters and beams of light and things like that. I don't even think we'd lit cigarettes. My friend says, what the F is that? And we looked and sure enough, there's this formation of lights uh, in a V-shape. Your typical classic, you hear it all the time, you know, the, the black triangle thing. But this was just lights. They weren't flashing. They were kind of shimmering, twinkling. This thing was maybe the size of a commercial airplane, maybe 747, but way, way high up. And the lights were so dim on it, all white that if you looked away and looked at the stars, the stars were brighter. If you looked away, you'd lose it. And it was cruising really, really slowly. No sound, no contrail, nothing. And we watched it until it disappeared. It literally went over the Hollywood Hills and away. Do you think it was something that we may hear, or is it something off planet? I've thought long and hard about what this could have been. I've never seen anything anywhere else that that was similar to. This is something that can not only stand stationary, or fly stationary rather, in the air. It's silent, it doesn't have any emissions, it doesn't seem to have an actual structure to it. It's just a formation of lights. So that really makes me lean towards, maybe it's a visitor, maybe it's a, a scientist from another world on a reconnaissance mission. I think a lot of modern sightings are just misidentified. And actually throughout history, people have real ignorance of what's in the in the night sky but for at least a hundred years I think there is credible evidence that there are nuts and bolts craft from places with technology that is not human and do I want to say it's alien I guess I have to when you eliminate everything else during the earliest days of flying saucer mania there was almost cult-like fanaticism that grew up around UFOs and their occupants. While most sightings revolved around distant observations of strange lights or craft, there were occasional encounters with their pilots. During the late 50s and into the 70s, a movement grew up around the idea of extraterrestrials as a sort of savior of humanity, with many of those claiming contact with the aliens gaining an almost prophet-like reputation amongst their followers. While this is an often overlooked period of UFO history, a lot of the information gleaned from contactees is still part of the subject today. It wasn't until investigators like John Keel began discussing the idea of the others being dimensional travelers that people began to consider other possibilities. There's even groups that believe that extraterrestrials are not necessarily from outer space. There's a lot of this multi-dimensional sort of theories being thrown around that these are actually overlapping worlds. There's uh, flap areas, perhaps, where there's high uh, amounts of other paranormal activity going on. So I think it's interesting that it's taking a little bit of that turn, because some people are starting to get more onto that sort of train where it's they're not from space. They're from just another world. They could be us in a parallel universe. Ultra terrestrials are people who are coming from an alternate dimension other than our own that stands alongside ours and the barrier between the two dimensions gets a little wonky or weak and that allows a pass through between the two. 
or that the aircraft is just so advanced that it's able to pass through between that barrier and create a window between the two dimensions. I think John Keel's place in the whole speculation around unidentified things in the skies, his contribution to that was the idea of there being sort of a cosmic trickster behind the scenes. I believe he coined the term ultra-terrestrial to indicate that there was a force or a personal presence operating on a spiritual level that we typically couldn't see. This being or beings would from time to time come into our reality mostly for the purpose of just messing with us for reasons of amusement that it seemed to derive from this activity. Where do you personally kind of fall in, in your own maybe theorizing or, or beliefs about what is at the heart of the UFO mystery? The, the tricksters are excellent at mimicking and playing tricks and trying to fool us. And uh, I, I think it's extreme irony that uh, we think we're the only people in the entire universe. More and more, uh, when I'm talking to scientists who uh, believe that there's something to the UFO phenomena, they are more apt to believe that these could be something from alternate universes or other dimensions. You hear a lot in science about multiple dimensions and things like this, that mathematically the science shows that this is possible. I think there's been a move in relatively recent decades to explain UFOs in an interdimensional way, to sort of take some of the concepts of quantum physics as they're popularly understood, and to use that as a way of transporting something across vast spaces and times. My favorite, quite honestly, that these craft are something that are traveling through dimensional borders from other universes. I find that one personally very compelling because of where uh, string theory and quantum physics has brought us today, you know, with this concept that, oh yeah, there are other dimensions of existence. Um, we don't know how to get there, but we know they're there. It would account not just for UFOs, but also other paranormal phenomena, such as other creatures or maybe even ghosts that maybe somehow are part of us exists in some other dimension. So those scientists, you know, entertain this idea and kind of think of this as a theory that would fit other paranormal phenomena. The idea of wormholes or things of that nature, uh, portals, if you will, has the benefit of being a convenient, imaginative response to the, the question of how do you get a craft or a ship from one place to another across vast distances. It also has the benefit of not being provable or disprovable. The sheer bizarre nature of some reports is what has influenced some of today's investigators to look beyond outer space for answers as to the origins of UAPs. Cases like those often reported in locations like the Chestnut Ridge, Skinwalker Ranch, or Sedona seem to defy what logic would dictate if we are in fact dealing with a visitor from the stars. Many investigators find their perception of the subject in general shifting drastically the further they get into their tenure due to the strangeness of the reports they take. These cases often leave them asking far more questions than they had going in and occasionally can cause them to change their personal opinions on the origin of the phenomenon entirely. What's, a, what's another case that sort of stands out to you? Oh, there was, though there's some fun ones. There was a case in Northern Utah of two boys that are watching TV late at night in 1972, I believe it was. They, they were watching their favorite show and all of a sudden they're looking at what looks to be like a science fiction movie. Instead of a movie, it, the characters in the movie are looking at them like, what, what, what are you guys doing? So he reached up to touch the knob and a big spark jumped out of the TV set and knocked him on his keister. So he's wondering what's going on now. These creatures, whoever's on the inside the TV looking at him, wondering what's going on here because they didn't expect it either. So then the TV goes out, they run outside, and there's a big UFO right over their house. So. <laughs> Why do you think UFOs are here? Uh, I don't know. We may be some science class experiment. We may, we may be here. They may be here for a multiplicity of reasons. 
the idea that there are other realities that are typically unseen by us, but that occasionally touch our reality is actually quite ancient. Writings such as the Bible, for example, do describe a world beyond our own that does interact with ours. It doesn't necessarily use the language of interdimensional, but it does use the language of heaven and earth or principalities and powers that's interpreted in different ways, but can certainly, I think, be understood in, in light of interdimensional or uh, portals. So that this idea has actually been around as long as there's been recorded history. What if the UFOs aren't coming from above or an alternate dimension? One of the most popular theories is that UFOs are simply us. But what does that mean exactly? In some ways, debunkers would fall into this category, as the typical assumption amongst the skeptical community when it comes to a UFO sighting is that it's either A, known aircraft being simply misidentified, or B, a hoax perpetrated by an attention-starved human being. But there are other angles to this particular hypothesis. Of course, the most conservative theory is that they are Russian or Chinese technology that is, or, or even black projects that we're not aware of. Sometimes you hear about a more terrestrial theory where it's human beings, particularly the United States governments or other governments like Russia or China who have developed advanced aircraft that they are testing in our airspace. And that's another possibility that the hard part for that one is that we've been seeing this technology demonstrated for a long time. For instance, in World War II, when we're flying propeller planes, you know, they're seeing these balls of light zipping around all over. That's technology, certainly that was beyond what we have now, let alone back then. Then you have people who say, well, flying saucers really are ships that have time travel. And they're us from the future coming back to try to save humanity. You know, some people believe the little alien greys are what humans eventually will evolve into, and they're coming back in order to, to try to save the future, so to speak. While everyone has a theory as to the origins of UFOs, the best source of information tends to be the eyewitnesses themselves. People like Sean Kevin Jason and Sam Sheeran have seen similar yet unidentifiable craft in the sky, and both have disparate theories about what may have been piloting them. It makes me wonder if there is an aspect of theorizing about where these things are coming from that acts as a sort of coping mechanism for dealing with a phenomenon that we might never have any greater understanding of. After all, if we can at least catalog a sighting as merely secret government craft or aliens from outer space, then we've already answered a number of the questions we might have otherwise spent the rest of our lives asking. I actually had a sighting when I was 12 years old. Uh, my, my origin story, it was in 1995, it was the summer, and I was fishing off the St. Lawrence River. And I was with my parents, they were inside our motel, we were staying in a motel, and the dock was right off of our motel. And it was turning dark. As I'm reeling my line in, I saw these lights in the water. and. I thought something was under the water. So I literally like got down, put my, my face in the water, and then I realized it was a reflection. So I look up and I just saw three white lights in a triangular formation and a sort of red, orange, hazy ball in the middle. I didn't see like a structure or you know, machinery or anything. I just saw the lights in a triangular formation just floating. They started to move across the water, hovering silently. There was no noise whatsoever. And I started yelling for my dad to like come out and see this. He did come out and actually see the tail end of this thing as it headed towards Canada. And then it just disappeared out of sight. Now I think looking back at it as an adult, I would think eh, it was probably just a top secret military project. You know, this is the 90s. Stealth bombers were just starting to uh, be tested. What was your sense, of, I guess, about the origins of what you were looking at? Did you think it was something extraterrestrial or, or government, secret government craft, or what did you think? That was a tough one because the lights told me it was man-made. Carl Sagan would say, you know, any sufficiently advanced technology would appear like magic. 
And there was nothing magical about these lights. You know, they're standard filament bulbs that have been around for a long time. And you have the lights, you have the color, you have the shape. That was, from my perspective, uh, an advanced stealth aircraft. Would it be disappointing to you if it was strictly government made? I wouldn't be disappointed if it was military or human craft of some kind for whatever purpose. I wouldn't be disappointed. I'd be perhaps a little worried, perhaps a little bit, I don't know, uh, betrayed. We're in such a world now where if they have this kind of technology, there are so many problems in the world that they could be fixing, yet they're advancing all of this into that direction and we're being lied to when it could be put to better use is, is a frightening prospect because what are they using it for? Where are they going? And potentially, how frightening could that be? Do you have a personal opinion on if these things exist, if UFOs exist, uh, what, what is behind the phenomenon? Yes, they exist or people wouldn't talk about it or see them or all that. No, I don't know what it is. I, I really don't know what's behind it. I don't know if it's aliens. I don't know if it's coming from us. I don't know if it's mis misidentifications. I, it's probably all those things and more. But the one thing I do know is that people get affected. People get affected very deeply. They, they have their whole lives changed in a few seconds. So if somebody says, this is what it is, you know, it's like, okay, that's your view of what it is. I don't know if it is what it is. And especially with the UFO thing, that there, there may not be any is there. The is is what we make of it in many cases. And it's, it's like a giant Rorschach blot, you know, UFO, ufology is or the subject, I think. I don't really have a theory of origin. I guess maybe it's because I'm still trying to figure out if these things exist as we've been told they do for decades now. Maybe there's something going on that we haven't even created a hypothesis about just yet. Or maybe the phenomenon is so difficult to grasp that every time we think we have a handle on it, it will change form once again and slip through our fingers and leave us floundering for answers. Witnesses like Ryan, Sam, and Sean remind me of Norman Muscarello or any of the other witnesses that played a role in the Exeter incident. Following the incident in Exeter, the Air Force arrived to investigate the event and, as with many cases, Project Blue Book simply wrote the whole thing off as misidentification of known aircraft. In the years following, skeptics came forward to offer their own alternative explanations for what it was that was witnessed that night, all of them failing to enlighten those that were present for the initial event as to what it was they'd actually seen. In 1980, Norman Muscarello gave an in-depth interview wherein he was asked what he believed he actually saw in Exeter that night. His response was that we would have to be naive and ignorant to believe ourselves alone in the universe, but ended by stating that he didn't know what it was. Muscarello died in 2003 and up to the time of his death insisted that what he'd seen was something extraordinary. Coming up on the next episode of On the Trail of UFOs. This is Nevada National Security um, Site area here, so they don't have to play by the same rules as the military. And this is one of those where one person came out and said that he worked on uh, back engineering alien technology at Area 51. Well, of course, the rumor was that uh, you know Bob Lazar was working out there reverse engineering extraterrestrial spacecraft, and maybe they possess alien bodies. I knew Bob Lazar before he worked at Area S4. So uh, several months, we met at John Lear's house, and he came and he says, you guys are totally freaking high. I'm working on one of these things.